episode three of the podcast today. Who have we got, Ronnie? We've got Christy Munns today, and Jesus, it's been a uh, roller coaster ride through life for him. Yeah, obviously, um, transition from a jockey to a trainer. Successful and jockey. Successful champion jockey. And um, spending time in Hong Kong jail and obviously beating cancer as well. Yeah, yeah. So don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and also subscribe, subscribe. to our YouTube channel. Hey, mate. Hello, mate. How are you? That was a bit of an encore, bit of a <laughs> bit quick of a, introduction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How's the beers? Yeah, cold. cold. Mm. Lovely. Thanks, boys. That's all right. A bit of a um, couple of hiccups, but we're in, we're going now. <laughs> um, tell um, a few, like, we obviously know a little bit about your racing wise, but how, how were you introduced into racing as a, to become a jockey? Uh, yeah, well, I'd sort of got to the end of year 10, mm. hated school, <laughs> and uh, was never going to be a basketball player or anything <laughs> like that. So I was, I had about uh, three show jumpers at the time. I was doing my last year of school and, um, I had no real idea what I was going to do. I was sort of more probably going to go on the show jumping circuit and get a team of horses and, and uh, live that kind of a lifestyle, which I really enjoyed. But I uh, did a bit of work experience in Queensland with uh, an uncle of my father's up here in Brit- at Eagle Farm. And, um, plus, I went and started with a couple of friends of mine at the races down home around the Northern Rivers and really enjoyed it. And Because um, you're originally from Casino? Casino, yeah. Grew up down there. Was born in Lismore and grew up on the Northern Rivers there. And, it was good. It was a good place to grow up too, country area. And uh, who was the leading trainers like around, like in casino around that area? Ah, uh, yeah, that blokes like uh, Jimmy Bottrell. Jimmy Bottrell was there. Athel Farmer, Billy Folly, still going around. <laughs> Farmer, yeah, yeah. There's a heap of old trainers there. This was like you know, I'm talking about the late '80s, early '90s. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, oh, I tell you, mate. There's some rough boys down there. there. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I remember, ride, ride? I remember riding track work when I was 15. It was that cold. Oh, there was right. no lights on the track. <laughs> there was cattle still on the sand track that we were working <laughs> on. And I'd have to come back and my hands were frozen to the reins. I couldn't undo it. And, it was, and I felt sorry for my dad actually at the time because he, um, he was a bricklayer and he'd have long days as well. Like he'd, he'd get up and, you know, he'd be gone from sun up till sundown and, um, when I started riding work, he dropped me in, dropped me in at the track, and uh, I'd ride work in the morning and then pedal me push bike to my grandmother's place, have breakfast, and then go to school. So, um, so you, you still did a bit of schooling while you were riding as well. I finished my last, probably my last term. Okay, I mean, okay. I had my last term. I was at, I was at, it was doing year ten. My last term, I was riding track work as well as I had three show jumpers that I was looking after as well. And I mean. Probably schooling was running third out of all them. I had n- real no interest in school, but I mean, it, it was um, it was pretty full on See, at the I time. See, I didn't know about the sh- the show jumpers. Like, I know you you do a little bit of it now, but not even back then. Like, you're right into the show jumping. Yeah, well, I don't do that much now. We go. Mm. I used I, I used to when I was a kid. I quite mm. enjoyed it, you know. And I'm, but I seen a video of you jumping a horse. Remember the video you sent me? Yeah, you jumping a horse. What was what horse was that one? That of your was old the horse in the jump off series. It's just been on TV. That's yeah, so right. that was that was a retired horse that we had, and we give it to um. Um, one of the young girls that worked for me, Corey's girlfriend, Sarah, and uh, and uh, she started to re-educate him and re-home him and train him, and he's actually done quite well. He's quite mm-hmm. a nice horse to jump. Um, but, yeah, it was more when I was sort of, you know, from 10 to, 10 to 16 was when I was into my show jumping and quite enjoyed it. So you started apprenticeship with who, at Casino, or did you come to no, Brisbane? No, up here. I come straight up here to Brisbane, yeah, and I was only riding track work down there yep. for um, – that's your guy you might know, Ken Callaghan. Yeah. He was, he was actually <laughs> he was training. He was a good trainer. Yeah, very good trainer. Him and his wife, Marg. Yeah. And um, they were, and Karen and Ben, the, the son yeah, and daughter, yeah. they, were, they were in casino at the time. So I started riding track work for him, actually. And he was doing a bit of pre-training for um, uh, Jimmy Griffiths at the time yeah. at the Gold Coast. And uh, so we'd have a few of their horse, sort of horses. We'd get them up and going. And uh, mm. you're right, he was a very good trainer. We used to have, I'll never forget, he had a, a little horse there called Mr. Goldsby. He was a broken down <laughs> thing with knee issues and that, but... I can remember riding him work every morning because he was a lovely horse to ride and that. And he ended up going and winning three Tabulon Cups. <laughs> Tabulon. <laughs> three in a, three years in a row. Yeah, all places Tabulon. But he was a, he was a good open open sprinter. Yeah. I remember him. I was only just remember him from being a kid, like in Canberra, and he was a good trainer. Very good trainer. Very good yeah. trainer. Yeah. Good with the horses, though. Yeah. So yeah. you come up to up to here, obviously, you apprentice to... Eric Kerwin. Eric Kerwin. Okay. Yeah, so I was introduced to him. Was he at Eagle Farm or...? At Eagle yep. Farm, yep. Um through my father's uncle, Danny Munts, who was an old trainer himself. Um, but Eric had about, I think he had about, at the time when I first started, had about 20, 25 horses. And we used to have to, um, there was no OHS and no traffic like <laughs> there is now, so we'd have to ride him to the track of a morning. And I ride a bit like Nudgy Road and that. Like, yeah. Where was the yeah. stables at? 
Pring Street. Pring Street. So yeah. Pring Street, like there were stables oh, all around that Hendry area. Pring Street. Yeah, That's Pring Street. Like all the... Twelve. If you drive past Twelve Pring Street, there's a big house. It's a big Queenslander. Twelve. Down the back of that was where our stables were. That's a fair walk to the track. Yep. Yeah, we'd walk down Pring Street and then we'd go down the end of Main Street, walk down the end, and where now where the thousand metre shoot is there at, at Main Street. Yeah, that used Just to be where we, that we used to walk up. Oh, over where there. Heathcote's old, uh, stables is yeah. like that. So where Heathcote's were up over there, that we'd walk up that, through there. That's a that's a fair walk. Like. Yeah, but <laughs> it was good, you know. Like the horses back then, you could it wouldn't matter. You could ride. I suppose I they get used to it, don't they? Yeah, I used to ride one and lead two to the track <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> and, what did your old boss always tell you all the time? Always let the slow one go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, remember your, your lead one? You got one on each hand. Yeah. You always remember which one the good one was. Yeah, 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 and. uh but they get used to it. Yeah. And yeah, in that time when there was no, not like it is now, like there was not as much traffic on the road and no. as well as noisy and that sort of thing. But I mean, the horses were, I think, um, uh, probably not trained differently, but they were probably, um, it's hard to explain, but they were, they were educated a little bit differently than what mm. they are now, you know. Oh, they're a lot better horsemen back then. So obviously the horses were a lot more used to that sort of s- style of training yeah, and that. Exactly. And I mean, like we, um, they when the stables, they were, quite old at the time because he'd been a trainer for a long leading trainer up here for a long time mm. and um he'd sort of started to wind down a little bit like 25 was a big number back then okay back in the late 80s like in brisbane like most most trainers had a had a home and in the back they'd have half a dozen boxes or 10 boxes and yeah. that was their string yeah yeah whereas it wasn't until probably um the mid 90s where they started to get bigger when Billy Mitchell started to come up here with his with his satellite team and Peter Moody, and then all of a sudden people went from having 15, 20 horses to having 20 and 30 and then 50 and 60 sort of horses, and that's even now still a big So street. was there ever any horses um, on course at Eagle Farm? Not back when I was here, no. no. The horses on course weren't until I, I moved back from Sydney. When the stables were that small, did they have second jobs back then, or was it more of a still, still full-time gig? Some did. Yeah. Some trainers did, yeah. Some trainers had second jobs. You know, they might have been, I don't know, mowing lawns or carpet cleans or something like that, but they might have only had two or three horses yeah, too. Okay. But, you know, like um, trainers like my old boss, he was just, he was purely a trainer and, um, you know, Desi McGee and there was a lot of old trainers that were just Barry Miller and they were just horsemen. Okay. Or just horses and horsemen. So you, you've obviously gone from Casino to Eagle Farm. How did you end up back in Sydney? Oh, in Sydney. So, well, that was, that was a... So that how was long did you spend in Brisbane as an apprentice or did yeah, you Yeah, so I did, I did me complete, I did four years up here. Are you four years? Yeah. So, um, I come out of my time, I can't remember when, 92, something like that, I think. Did four years in my apprenticeship and, um, when I come out, I was, as an apprentice, I was leading rider up here as an apprentice mm. and, um... I remember Doc Chapman had wanted me to go down there a few times. He'd sort of asked me to go down a few times. I'd sort of been a bit reluctant and hadn't gone. And then um, after I'd won the 10,000 on Brossa Boy, um, Friedman's asked me to go down and ride Superimpose. Okay. That was in 1992. So uh, I went down and rode Superimpose. I went down for three months in 92 from about um, August it would have been through until the Melbourne Cup. Yep. So that because that was my first ride in Melbourne Cup in 1992, mm-hmm. and in the meantime when I went down there, like Kathy and I weren't married at the time, and we were, we were living in Sydney and just struggled probably to fit in yeah. in Sydney. It was pretty full on, pretty hectic. It's a big, and it's a big, big, big change from Brisbane to Sydney. One hundred percent. And I mean, I didn't have a lot of luck down there either. The first time when I rode Super, I got carved up a few times, and he probably wasn't going as good as what he, he was was, in it, was in the end. Like they, he ended up going back to Melbourne, and then he moved like. So he went from Sydney back to Melbourne, but then after they'd been in Melbourne, they run him in the Canberra Cup and he won the Canberra Cup. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And then he, after that, he was back in Melbourne. That's when he won his last Cox Plate. Okay. So when he was in Sydney, he just he was he was just never going as good as he should have been until he went back to Melbourne. But having said that, he, he was a very, very good Were they good riding him the same back then when you were riding him compared yeah. to when he started winning? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Always, yeah. always ridden back. Yeah. Sort of thing. He was one of those horses. I mean, you could never ride him out of his comfort zone. That was just how he was ridden. But I mean, he was just a... Um, he was just, once he got to Melbourne, he was a different horse, you know. So he wasn't your first crew. Who was your first crew one winner? Barossa Boy, winning the 10,000. 10, yeah. yeah. So, and you know that same year that was? 92. 92. 92. Yeah, 92. And that same year I, I, um, went on grooming. So I rode two group ones the first year when I won the So Brisbane. pretty much you come out of your time and rode yeah, two group, group ones. ones. Yeah. That would have kicked yeah. you along a bit. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was good. I think my, well, my first major winner when I come out was a horse of, um, of uh, Cummings, a horse called Coolong Road. I won the Queensland Guineas on him. I actually might have come out in '91. Actually, I think I come out mm. of my time, and um, I run the Coolong, uh, the Queensland Guineas for Bart Cummings 
on a horse called Coolong Road. Okay. We sort of was good So you've ended up down in Sydney. And then how, do you, how did you connect? Who did you connect up with first down there? No, well, I was going down to Freedman's Freed- to start oh, Sorry, with. when you were going down with Freedman's, yeah. yeah. So, and then I was sort of just... How did fre- that work out with Freedman's, huh? No, in the end, of, no. Uh, well, we'll put it this way. Because they end up moving, didn't they, in the th- end? They moved, yeah. yeah. And I'd sort of went down there for those three months, mm. for three months only. And, I, and when I rode, um, I rode a horse for Tommy Smith in the Melbourne Cup, a horse called Aquidity. Yeah. And I ended up getting a month suspension out of it. I, <laughs> I think I, I think I put a few of them through the fence <laughs> or something. I can't remember. <laughs> and anyway, I said to Kathy because I had a mother. I said, oh, I said, I, I said I've had enough of this. I said, let's just go back to Brisbane and regroup. Oh, okay. And and uh, so we moved back. We moved back at the end of 90, 92 or ninety two or ninety ninety two. It was. We moved back, and then I started to get going again. Mm. And um, we sort of had a house that we'd been building while we we're in Sydney up here at Boondle. And we sort of moved into there. We got married and, and our yeah, first boy was born. And we probably stayed here then until we moved back to Sydney in 1995. 95. Yeah. I, I always thought it was a bit earlier than that you were there. No, 95, because uh, that was my first year I won um, the Epsom on Nick's Joy was when I moved back. Yeah, not many people would have known he went down there and then come back yeah, up correct. and then went back down mm. again. Yeah, so, so I was only down there for – the first time I was only down there for a short time and just sort of – I really had no uh, – so what made support. you move the second time, really? Because obviously the first time was a bit hit and miss. I think it was just a challenge. Yeah. Because oh, I had no real, um, I had no real stable to ride for, okay. and I had no um, backing of any what any of any sort. I just sort of lobbed at Ramwick and started riding track work, and um, was riding work basically for Tommy Smith was still alive at the time, mm. and for whoever else I could, and just sort of worked hard and did my best. And for And who me. was the first one to give you a bit of a kick on down there? Obviously. Uh, well, it was probably, well, first, my first major winners were for Tommy, Tommy. Smith, yeah. Mm. And I mean, I will say one thing, he's, and he gays the same too, like if you'd turn up and ride and work, he'd always oh, give course. you a go, you know, as, as yeah. best he could. And, you know, you weren't always on the on the apex, you'd always have Shane or Jimmy or... So who was, the, who was these main riders back then? When back you then there? was um, Shane, do I? Shane. Shane was there and Jimmy Cassidy was still on. It was probably just, um, it was just before the jockey tapes affair. <laughs> so good they timing. Were, they were, yeah, yeah, it was. But they were sort of the the two main ones. And I mean, Gavin Eads was riding there as well, and and Wayne Harris, and there was a heap of great riders, great riders, great riders, yeah, riders yeah. All, all sort of at Ramwick. It seems such a great period. Like even when we look back, like I know we weren't riding back Correct. then, but everyone that talks about that period, mate, you're I in still, such a good group of jockeys. Mate, I tell you something. I still everybody I talk to now, I still reckon the nineties. The nineties was the best era of racing, yeah. Yeah, okay. you know, not just jockeys. I mean, era yeah. in racing, horses as well, horses, mm. uh, racing in general. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun, and it was, it was, it was racing was good. Yeah. It was good horsemen, good trainers, good riders. Though. It was very competitive, mm. you know, and it's com- not competitive now. Don't get me wrong, it is, it is competitive now, but it's, a, it's, it's, it seemed like back then there was like, we have Winks and all these sort of horses now. But now, back then, it was like there was six of those sort of horses. Yes. And they're racing against yeah. each other all the time. Well, I've been watching derbies and watching Falante and, and all yeah. them good horses, nothing like a Dane and Saintly and them. They're all hitting the line together yeah. in the cockpit. Like four or five horses going to the uh, line. They were good crazy. horses, mate. Yeah. Proper they clashes. Very good horses. Yeah. And, but there was good trainers too, you know, and they were proper good horsemen, good horsemen. Tra- yeah. Like Tommy Smith was leading trainer through weight of numbers, as Waller mm. is now sort of thing, but they had to work to that level. But besides them, like Brian Mayfield Smith, He's, He's probably one of the greatest trainers you'd ever want to ride for, and that a very, very good trainer. But so they, out yeah. of all the trainers you've ridden for down there, and what, even Queensland or whatever, who would be the best trainer you've ridden for? Um, like I know, I know people say you know it's 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 a cliche to say oh Tommy Smith because obviously he's a good trainer yeah, but they had big sure. numbers. That's right. But who would who would they, if they had I, if everyone had ten horses who would be the best trainer? Oh, if and the answer I'm going to give you is probably surprise you, but I mean for me. A good trainer is a trainer that can get the best out of ordinary horses. Correct. Yeah. You know, they don't have to have a stable full of million dollar Correct. yearlings or a stable full of winks and that sort of thing. And that's not taking any, anything away from the great the trainers, trainers that are there now. But if you can get a horse and you can extract every ounce of ability out of that horse, to me, that's a good trainer. Mm. Yeah. And for that reason, I, I always think of Jack Denham and Barry Baldwin. I think mm. they are two of the better trainers I've ever rode for. And Brian Mayfield Smith was a very, very good trainer. Mm. A very good yeah. trainer. Like, um, he trained a lot of Group One winners, but probably one of you, you can ask him yourself. That probably one of his biggest days in racing was when I won third on the in the Melbourne Cup, or maybe better for him. He was it was like he'd stoked. won ten Group Ones, yeah, you know. Stoked. But Barry Baldwin, like for me, he's always been a trainer that's never had the big name, wealthy, rich horses. Mm. 
But he always he, finds he, a good horse. He, he always finds a good horse and he yeah. can always win a race with any horse you, you give him, you know. Yeah. So to me, I think that's that's a that's a good trainer. So I'm pretty sure I asked Corey Brown one day what who was same thing. Mm. And he said Mayfield Smith as well. Mm. Mm. Remember that time he went down and spent time in Melbourne, yeah. Yeah, very good trainer. Very good trainer. Mm. So uh, that was a small period there. So Jezebel was in there somewhere along the line. Was it 98? So that was 98. So we'd sort of been in Sydney for a while mm. then. Um and uh, Jezebel was sort of come around through. I'd been to New Zealand in the January. I'd went over to ride in the Auckland Cup, and um, um, I went over to ride a horse called Aerosmith in the Auckland Cup. And um, uh, Ryan Hurdle's father trained it. And anyway, I'd been offered the ride on Jezebel and couldn't ride it because I'd already committed to Aerosmith. So anyway, we, I'd ridden Aerosmith and hit the front 200 metres out, looked over winner and. Lo and behold, Jezebel comes down the outside and blows me out of the water. So I've, I've run a nice second to the eventual Melbourne Cup winner, you yeah. know, but I didn't know at the time. And I was just lucky that I sort of went home and, and um, I'd actually been to the football one one uh, Sunday afternoon. I got home half full of piss and Cathy said, oh, a bloke called Jenkins has rung you from New Zealand. I said, oh, what's he want? She said, oh, I want you to ride a horse called Jezebel in the Melbourne Cup. I said, oh, I'll ring him tomorrow. So I woke up the next morning, <laughs> I woke up the next morning with a nice hangover. <laughs> I said, mate, it's Chris Munts here. He said, oh, good. He said, uh, he said, would you be interested in riding Jezebel? I want a runner in this, this, this and this. And he said, and then in the Melbourne car, I said, mate, good as gold. And, mm. and it all worked out really good. It was sort of, I think she had three or four lead up runs into the Melbourne Cup. Yeah, so I, I'm, it's a bit young for us, but what, yeah. what did she, did she win any lead up races to the Melbourne Cup? No. No. Didn't win one. Okay. No, she went. So what happened was he actually did a very good job, Brian, because he um, won the, New Zealand Cup, yeah. which then Auckland Cup, which then qualified her for Melbourne. But so he then in the autumn he took her over to Melbourne just for a trip, and he gave her one run in a Group One race over there, and she ran third to tie the knot in a Group One. Okay. Um, and then he took her back to New Zealand, and he got her ready over there. He just took her back, give her a spell, and then he brought her back to Melbourne, and he just brought her along steadily. And um, I think the closest that she got in any race leading up to the Melbourne Cup was a fifth. Did she run in the, the big, big lead up, like the Corporate Cups or anything? Yep. Oh, she did. Yeah, yeah, she did. She ran in the. So, so she started off in the Yolumba Stakes, um, which was 2,000 metres. Then she ran in a, in a. No, so she ran in a mile group one. Then she went to a 2,000. She had two 2,000s from memory. And then she ran in the Caulfield Cup into the Melbourne Cup. Okay. So she, he had it all planned out, the races that he was... he was, And obviously getting that already into the race sort of thing, he could plan it properly. Yeah. Like it's hard as a trainer to... And the whole key to it was to get her in with no weight too. So she got on... She got so in if she won one of those races too, that would have mm. bumped if she don't, her up a bit. Yeah, if she would have won any of those. That's why he sort of kept her at the weight for age races because if, yeah. if you win one of them, you don't get any, any re-handicapping. So he kept her in mostly weight for age races. Yeah. And she ran good races in all of them without winning. Um, and you could feel like the first day I rode her, she was always... Because she was a Zabil mare mm. she was always quite nervy and quite hot mm. um but as the fitter she got the quieter she got the calmer she got and the, and the more sensible she got and what, what i didn't i didn't even look it up to be honest what sort of bar what barrier did you draw on that sort of stuff in the melbourne cup when she won you don't remember or? yeah out wide i think she out drew wide. 22 or 23 or something like that so yeah. she drew out quite wide and um you obviously quite confident believing that's been your the melbourne cup has been the big game day for grand fauna for her yeah it, it was and um he um it was funny because she'd started, she'd opened up 50 to 1. And when I'd first taken the ride on, I said to my manager at the time, Clocker Thompson, Craig Thompson, who was with RaceNet, he was managing me. And I said, mate, I said, I think I can win the Melbourne Cup. He said, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> I said, mate, I said, I'm telling you. I yeah. said, this thing won the Auckland Cup. Yeah. And I said, the thing they've got in the market, Aerosmith, I rode. Yeah. And I said. Oh, was it, it in the race? It was in the race. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was third or fourth favourite. Yeah. And I said, mate, I give it every hope. Yeah. And she tailed me up. So I said, and how far is the Auckland Cup? 20, two mile, two miles. It well. was two mile on yeah. the, at the time. I said, "Mate, if it's in the market, I said it'll, beat her, it, uh, it, it'll it won't beat it won't beat Jezebel home." Okay. She said, "Oh well." So anyhow, she was fifty to one at the time, and 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 fortunately, the owners over there had backed her. Yeah. And did uh, Kathy back it? No, I don't think so. She was pregnant <laughs> at the time. She was she was had other things on her mind. <laughs> and, anyway, and then um, by the time they jumped, she actually started favourite in the race. Equal favourite. Equal right? favourite. Mm. Yeah, wow. Well, That's a big, that. big shift. Yeah, so yeah. she was she was well supported. Well, what, did, what did she do after that, after the Melbourne Cup? Retired. Oh, she retired straight away. Mm. Pretty much. She never run again. He, he had sort of intended to bring her back. I mean, Brian had always wanted to take one to America. Oh. But 
you know, the Melbourne Cup took too much out of her and she never yeah. sort of come up. And did that. he so breed from her? I think the owners did. I don't think, I'm not sure if Brian did, no, but I think the owners sort of, I think they kept her and bred from her. Okay. And sold the, sold the. Well, obviously, she's a sort of a horse that means a fair bit to you, obviously, mm. winning a Melbourne Cup. But it, what's the best horse you think you've ridden, like, in your, back then, you know what I mean? What was the sort of one that you could line up and go, that's probably the best one I've ever ridden? Yeah. I mean, I never rode a champion. I never rode a Winx or, you know, anything like that. Yeah, but a lot of the list of the horses that you've won in group ones on, they've ended up being, like, they were, ended, yeah. up, ended up being very good horses. Yeah. yeah. And I look, I, I'm lucky that I have ridden a lot of very good horses, but... One that I always always have a soft spot for is Dance Hero. Dance Hero, yeah. I always really like him, that horse because, I mean, as a two-year-old, he done things that if he was a cult and he was a cult today doing it, you could write your own ticket. He'd be worth any yeah, amount of money. Yeah. He'd be yeah. worth absolute fortune. And even back then in the day, if he'd have been a cult, like he'd have been worth 30, 40, 50 million mm, back then. Back then, yeah. You yeah. know, which is, that's in 2004. Yeah, it's crazy. So he was, what that horse did, like he ran third in the breeders' plate, um, um, I didn't ride him, but he missed the start in the Breeders' Plate and run home and run third. They spelled him, brought him back, and then I, I got on him. And he was unbeaten through to the Magic Millions. He won two lead-ups into the Magic Millions, and he and he brained him in the Magic Millions. Um, then she put him away and gave Gay put him away and gave mm. him a bit of a freshen up. And he come back, and he was unbeaten. That horse was a two-year-old. He had a lead-up into the Golden Slipper. Mm. Won the Golden Slipper, won the Size Produce, and won the Champagne Stakes. Not a fortnight in between. Yeah. yeah. Saturday, wow. Saturday, Saturday. That's crazy. Twelve hundred, fourteen hundred a mile. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday is a two-year-old. Some of the things they could do with horses back then, like Mate, not, not that long ago, but it's, it's incredible crazy. what that horse did. You know, and, mm. and because he's a gelding, he never ever receives the recognition of what a a big name horse like yep. a Piero or Seaborn yeah. or something like that, because they're colts and they're name horses. Whereas yeah. Dance Hero, yeah. he still holds the, the race record. At Magic Millions? He's, no, the, oh, the, the, the Golden Slipper. Slipper. He still yeah. has a Golden Slipper race record. That's he crazy. just, it was incredible. He was a real big strong horse, wasn't he? I mean, yeah. He was just a natural two-year-old. Yeah. Natural two-year-old. Like, yeah. he was just a lovely animal. And it was funny because at the time, Mark Newman and I were riding work there and um, she had one real expensive cult that was working with Dance Hero that they'd paid a lot of money for, over a million dollars for at the time. And they were working together, always galloping together. And the, the expensive colt had the better of him a couple of times in the gallop. <laughs> but then as Dance Hero picked up what was doing, he used to just canter right. alongside him. Yeah. Just canter alongside him. It was quite interesting the way you could see him transform. But it's a good feeling. I know I haven't ridden the, the class of horses that you've ridden, but even as a, a jockey um, leading to those decent races, um, I've been similar circumstances where I'm sitting off horses that are favourite for the race or second favourite and it's um, stable companion mm. and just camping off it and just thinking I'm going a lot better than this <laughs> yeah, other one. Yeah, yeah. And everyone, you know, the press, they want to talk about the other one. You just walk away quietly confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great exactly. feeling. Oh, it is. It is, you know. And, I mean, you see plenty of those. There's plenty of horses that fly under the radars. And they, horses can improve for no real reason. There's no magic science behind it. Horses no. are just, they can improve. Um, another ho classic example is a horse called Accelerator. Mm. Like, he ended up going on and winning Doncaster and Epson. Mm. I won the Magic Millions on him as a two-year-old. But as a two-year-old, no one liked him. No one found him. He was never showing much. And I trolled him one day. And he just he just pissed up in a trial easily, you know. Mm. And I said to Gay, this is pretty good, this. She said, oh, well, take him to a midweek Wednesday too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said, he obviously I, won. I said, can I ride him? She said, oh, okay, you can ride him. And he won. Mm. Yeah, he won. And then he went on and he won the, the Magic Millions. But sometimes they, they just, they can improve out of sight. So he, so we'll have Dance Hero as the best horse you've ridden. Well, the soft. I, th I think he, look, I, th I think he is. Yeah, yeah, but that, you that's, know, that's just If you sat opinion, on his yeah. back and he won group ones on him, like yeah. it doesn't. I mean, I've got soft spots for a lot of them. I mean, yeah, Bra yeah. Brave Warrior, Kathy Ayn, Brave Warrior, and he won a Magic Millions, and like, mm. it was, he was he was a Oh, so I've got yeah. a question to ask you too. Someone asked on Twitter too, oh, we'll go to that later, but because you brought his name up already. Someone asked, um, ask him how good Brave Warrior is. He's, he was a freak horse. I think Mitchell Vickers, a guy that owns... Um, a share in chapter and verse. He right. sent me a text and said, oh, I'm asking you a brave warrior. The horse is a freak. You know yeah, what I mean, he, sort of thing? he was a very, very good horse. Very, mm. very good horse. Um, he won a Magic Millions okay. and um, I was actually meant to ride him and I had a fall early in the day. Oh, on the day? On the day. Yeah, I fell off one of Bruce Brown's actually. Down we went, I said, ahead and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on the ground unconscious and the, the Ambos have pick me up, put me in the meat wagon, and I said, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> the they, wagon. they said, you're going to the hospital. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm, I'm still in a daze. They said, I said, I'm riding Brave Warrior in the Magic Millions. <laughs> you idiot, you're not going anywhere. I said, I'm telling you now, you're not taking me to hospital. I got real cranky. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the, the lady said, well, 
the only way you can get out of this is she said, you can sign your name on this stat deck and I'll let you out. Mm. And I had a broken wrist at the time. She said, <laughs> she said, here it is. Here's the pen. Here's the paper. So you know, so I got all the pen. I just scribbled some sort of shit on the bit of paper. Wow. And she said, okay, where are you go. And Ray Murray, I'll never forget because and Ray Murray t- still tells the story. I was he, he was standing there watching me get up because he didn't want me to ride, obviously. Mm. Yeah. And he stood up there and he watched me and I stood up out of the back of the ambulance. I fell flat on my ass and she said, <laughs> get in the ambulance, you idiot. You're going to the hospital. And so that was the end of that. And um, so, so he picked the ride up on the day. Uh, Neil Williams. Neil Williams, oh, there you go. Neil had just come back from um, uh, Macau. Macau. Yeah. he just come back from Macau and didn't have any other rides on the day. And Harold Norman actually approached my boss and he said, look, Neil's there. He's having a sweat. If you want him, he can ride the horse. And so mm-hmm. Neil rode, picked the ride up and yeah, went on. And Sorry, I didn't ask you who trained it. My old boss, Eric Cohen. Eric Cohen. Yeah, so, uh, so he, he actually trained two Magic Million winners. Did he? And I rode his first one, Sunblazer. That was my very first Sunblazer, Magic Million. First yeah. Magic Minge, yeah. And I was, I, was, I was actually an apprentice then. I was only 18. Okay. And I was, um, he was by Daybreak Lover. And I actually broke him in when we bought him from the sales. <laughs> he didn't go to the paddocks. He just kept him at the stables. <laughs> and mate, this, the, this is what happens. So straight to the stables. And the boss said, well, he said, we better get a bridle and saddle on this horse. Oh, I said, boss, you just come to the stable. He'll be right. <laughs> so we put a saddle on him. We put a bridle on him one day and put him in the sand roll and we mouthed him. And then the next day I put a saddle on him and jumped on him in the sand roll. He had a bit of a pig root. And a... The third day, we had him off the lead pony. We were going around the roads. like Because that's what we did. You had, no, you had yeah. no paddocks or anything to ride around. So we, we're riding around down Pring Street, all around all the streets of Hendra. <laughs> Imagine doing that now. Yeah. Off the lead pony. It's a, it's a newly broken and yearling, right? But this is, this is what we could do back then. This was the way it was. Anyway, so turns out he was a very good galloper. He won his first start in a race, then he won the Magic Millions. Um, and then um, after that, I don't think he won. I think he might have won one or two more. That was all. But, he, you know, back in the day, the Magic Millions was worth a lot of money. So, so that, that could have been all that Magic Millions, another one. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he said it was a very good horse, eh? Very good, very good horse. Yeah, I mean, he won. He ran second to, um, um, what's that horse Bobby Thompson had? Won the derby. Dane win. Dane win. Dane win. <laughs> Dane win. He ran second to, to Dane win in the yeah, in the yeah. derby. Yeah, yeah. All the way up to the yeah the, the, the from sorry 12 the spring champion sorry the spring champion because oh, I didn't go to the derby that's right we didn't go to the we didn't go the, to the derby we brought him back to the Doncaster he ran third in the Doncaster to um to um thing of Friedman's Simon Marshall wrote it. Good old. That's a big effort though to go from that distance to that distance, like mm. twelve months. You know. Yeah. No, he was. He was good. Any horse. any any Magic Millions winners these days, they they really struggle to go to that next over the over the staying distances, don't they? Seem to. Mm. Yeah, they seem. It's just the way we breed them now, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, I, mean I think the two year olds these days, there's so much em- emphasis on them too, with the, particularly the big races. And they get pushed. Obviously. Yeah, and they get pushed. You know, your Magic Millions and Gold Slippers. Or, you know. mm. Not many, sort of like you said, they. They sort of peter out after the the big races. They yeah. just don't come back. Some of them do. I mean, that's why at Sunlight, I think she's an amazing filly. I know. Everyone amazing doesn't filly. realize how how good that horse is. And it's a, it's a filly. What she's done, you know, yeah. it's incredible, incredible effort. What she's done. She just brain him in a magic means, didn't oh. she? And has gone on with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and one good races too yeah. after that from bad gates too. Like yeah. uh, every uh, was it the, the was it the Moyer or something like that? Uh, Mooney Valley. She drew the outside or something like that. Mm. And they said, oh, she can't win from out there. Mm, mm. And Lou Carey just went see her straight the front, straight across them. Yeah, that's it. All over Red Rover. Yeah, yeah, a freak. Yeah. So, Melbourne Cup goes by, stay in Sydney a bit longer. Then, obviously, in 2005, 2006, you decided to take a contract in Hong Kong. Mm. How many winners did you ride in Hong Kong? Um, I actually run third in the premiership over there. I think I rode 45. Because did you have injuries or do you... Did you have injuries over there as well? No, I had. Or you come back to Australia for something, or no? I got. Um, I did have a fall. A fall, okay. Yeah, I had a fall, and I had a had a had a fracture in my hip, but I, in my femur, but I still rode with it, and um, I come back to ride um, um, Desert War and, and Dance Hero. That was Dance Hero's last win in a Group One on McKinnon Stakes Day in two thousand and six. I think it was. Did he win that? McKin- uh, Desert War won the McKinnon. McKinnon, yeah. And Des- and Dance Hero, he won the um the the. Salinger or what it was up the straight, yeah, yeah twelve hundred meters. So how'd you find Hong Kong? Like going from Brisbane to Sydney and back to Brisbane and back to Sydney. Then obviously Hong Kong, it's big, well, big yeah, change, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It was different. I mean, it was. It was one of those places where it's um, um, uh, not child friendly, I suppose. And we had <laughs> we had three kids. I oh, see. So you, you took all the kids there. Yeah, yeah. So they went over there, and um, we put them into the Australian school in Hong Kong, which was great. Australian yeah. School in Hong Kong was a terrific school, and, they, and the kids over there enjoyed it and, and did well, you know. But it was um, 
for me, I think um, the lifestyle of, of Hong Kong wasn't wasn't what I was used to and probably yeah. struggled to, to live with. Obviously, you know? being from Casino, too, it's a small town, and then obviously a few years later, obviously being in a place like that, like yeah. obviously Ronnie spent time in in Singapore. Asia is very different. I've um, even when I went to Hong Kong on occasions just for holidays and that, I find. Um, it's a lot more full on than Singapore. I think Singapore's mm. a little bit more relaxed and a bit more family friendly, mm. but it's still got that same mentality. Yeah, and and look, you know, it, it is what it is. But I, I, I was lucky. I, I rode for some very good trainers over there. I think I rode winners. Who's leading over there? The Johnny, trainers. Johnny, Johnny Sizes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and Johnny was good. Because he wouldn't have been over there long before you. Would... Uh, he'd, been he'd been there a little while. Johnny been there. Paul, How long has Paul, he been there for now? Paul O'Sullivan had only been there twelve months before I got there. Okay. He, he'd had one season. I, I got there his second season. I think I rode about 15 winners for Paul when I got mm. there. We had a really good, really good year. And um, Johnny, well, I mean, he was leading trainer and he would um, he gave me a lot of winners as well. But I also rode winners for a lot of other trainers over there too. And it was good. You know, like 43 winners in a season or 45 is in a season to, mm. is um, pretty good effort. First season? First season, yeah. That's good. Yeah. And who was the leading rider? That, who was the leading rider at that time? Uh, Dougie was. Douglas Dougie White. Was, oh, yeah, yeah Dougie. Douglas White. Was, was Robbie there? Yes, he was, and Robbie, uh, Robbie Fred was there. Preble was was um, Preble was. He would have just been there. Just yeah, he there. was probably runner up to Dougie, I think. Second, no, he'd been there a little while. He'd been there a little yeah. while. Pre- uh, Brett had been there a little while. Mm. Um, at the same time, I think Brownie went over there. Corey Brown and um, Olivia Deleuze was there. Mm. Um, that was pre Zach, wasn't it? Zach wasn't yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, Zach. Yeah, yeah. Come years later. Yeah, I don't think Zach went until two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, yeah. something like that. I think. Um, but Zach's done well. Zach's done well. Oh, he's, he's done terrific. He's done well for Australian mm. jockeys, obviously. My like, word. Yeah, you know, and it just proves that Australian jockeys can make it with the best. And mm. I, I find it really hard sometimes, and, and Ronnie the same too. Like, Ronnie spent a lot of time in Singapore, and and then when he come back, it's like it's like you come back, and isn't it? It's like you, no one knows who you are anymore, you know? Mm. Or, yeah, it's hard. Re- you sort of basically got to restart again. Um, and it was always hard for me because... I, even when, he, when I was in Sydney as an apprentice, I probably left a little bit too early as well. Mm. It was only one year out of my time. Um, I, d- I did want to travel and um, I saw the opportunity to go there. And I'd, I wouldn't say I, I, I regret it. It was very good to me. Mm. But mm. when I come back, I thought, where am I going to go? Like, I'm not established. I just come out of my apprenticeship and you go through, I think I did like a six months of a slow time. Mm. Um, and yeah, I had to try and reassess things and brought back a wife um which also (laughs) plays into it (laughs) brought back a wife (laughs) and had to work out you know where where's home yeah yeah well it's very early to leave to one year after you've been an apprentice and then obviously Hong Mm. Kong obviously you you spent a bit of time already before you decided to go over there but obviously in 2006 you obviously the whole dream of the whole thing turned into a bit of a nightmare for you Mm. can you tell us a little bit about that Oh, well, that was just, I suppose, it was just another splitter in the arse as you slide down the banister <laughs> yeah. of life, wasn't it? You know, I, I was, uh, I, uh, And it's crazy to think that people, like, for, for us in Australia, like, that's that's wild, that sort of stuff. Like, and it, I know it's a different country and you have to live by their rules and that sort of stuff, but yeah. for us Australians, we find that hard to, like, even from, even from now, from yeah. a jockey's point of view, like, Nash obviously went through the same thing not long mm. ago and he never spent any time in jail or anything like that, mm. so... I think for me it was probably just a fact I was probably a bit naive to it all and didn't get the right yeah. sort of... Uh, uh, information or representation that I needed and um, um, you know like I said probably had the wrong sort of representation yeah. and advice and and then up wearing the brother because I didn't even know this till you told me recently actually that you actually come back when you when they when it all went through or whatever and they've charged you or whatever and then you've come back to Australia and, and obviously continue to ride and then decided to go back and, and well, fight I st- the well, charges I thought I was, well I was still doing the right thing you know you thought I, you, were, you obviously I thought, thought I was doing you were the right thing of... I thought I didn't think I'd do anything wrong you know yeah. how did it all go down did um, like was Kathy over there with you at the time, or did they? They just the they had just or? gone. They had just gone because it was the end of the season. Yeah, oh, it was okay. it right at the end, mm. was it? Right mm. at the end. So mm. they'd already left, and then mm. it all sort of come out. Or yeah, yeah. And um, so they were at home at the time. But anyway, it's a, it's a scary them. thing, though, isn't it? Too like I I, I spent a little bit of time over the season. And they're real bit funny, the the Mauritians and that sort of thing. Like when you go to leave the country, they're like, oh, this and that can happen. I'm like, well, I've done nothing wrong, mate. Like mm. it's not something yeah. to worry about. And Singapore and Hong Kong are the same sort of situation. And it's tough to, to go back and, and obviously think, oh, well, I'll just go back and fight it and then I'll clear my name. Or even if I do get time or whatever, it is what it is and I'll just come back home or whatever. And then obviously you, you got you got 
sentenced to jail for 30 months, which is crazy with mm. that sort of situation. Mm. Um, that would have been hard to obviously deal with like at that time. Yeah, well, I couldn't I couldn't get my head around it, obviously, and uh, and uh, just had to deal with it. Simple as that. I couldn't do anything more. I mean, I'd, I'd, like I said, I probably didn't have the right sort of representation that I deserved or, mm. or should have, could have had. And um, um, thought I was doing the right thing by going back, which I was meant going to do. Going back and fighting it. Yeah, yeah. anyway. It, um, and the and the, to- the time that you actually went to go back and fight it to like you won't obviously I well, you obviously don't know anything about it to be honest like you can Google it all you want but you don't actually know it's hard to explain mm. to someone like you go over and fight something like this and next minute saying no you're going to jail and obviously you're not going back to Australia and things are up in the air straight away it, mm. it'd be hard to deal with yeah but straight away like the the first instance I can I can't imagine how yeah. you would have felt. Mm. Well, and it was it was not only hard for me; it was hard for Kathy because she came back with me, you know, and um, and so she was sort of thrown to the walls pretty much straight away as well. Yeah. But I mean, we were lucky. Paul O'Sullivan is a very good, close friend of mine and of ours, and he he was he was great. You know, if it hadn't been for him, it probably would have been a lot harder. But he was a so you obviously got a lot of support from the racing fraternity over there as well. No, no, only, all, only Paul. All would have. Only yeah, Paul. Okay, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, only Paul really. Yeah. And um, Johnny was pretty good there for a while, but Paul was probably the main one that sort of helped me and okay. as best he could. And you've obviously stayed friends with him. Oh yeah, I still talk to Paul re- regularly. Yeah, and what what jail? Like you can Google it. You want? Let's say you can't find out what what jail did you actually spend time in over there? Oh, What's mate, the name was, of the jail? What was it called? Um, I try to forget those sort of things. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was called. It was right near. It's, it actually, if you want to make a funny side of it, it actually had scenic views. It was out there. <laughs> it was out looking over Repulse so Bay, you know. So you ever got it was, down, the, it was down, <laughs> the, down near Stanley Market somewhere, I remember him telling me. Stanley so. Market? Yeah, down, yeah, down, yeah, down okay. there somewhere. So it actually, um, it was in that vicinity anyway. To be honest, I don't know the exact name of it. But oh, that's, well, that's what makes it. Was. You can Google it or you want. It doesn't yeah. come up a name or anything like that. So I said, I'm mm. even trying to Google it. So I can't find the name. I'll have to just ask him. Mm. But obviously, that would have been a rough time. Um, the funny side of it, can you tell us anything like in there, like not that it happened, not, you obviously, there wasn't, you probably would have stayed to, your, stayed to yourself, obviously. Any, any, um. Had to go being Chris Munts in a, in a jail yeah. over like there. Even like even being English. I was yeah. in Singapore at the time and everyone over there knew Chris Munts because you're riding really well over there, getting all these winners and, um, every owner, oh, you, you know, jockey Chris Munts, this and that. So I'm sure even when. You've no disgruntled punters in there, or <laughs> no, no. They, were, I think they, they all wanted to be punters. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> probably but, made more friends. Yeah, no, no. Look, uh, look you've just got to, you've just got to adapt. It's simple as that. You can't. There's no, there's nothing you can really say or do on anything. Yeah. I mean, you've just got to live on your, your instincts and your, your street sense, and you know, treat everybody with respect until they do something wrong and that sort of thing. But. Mm-hmm. Um, Living yeah. obviously wasn't that great in there. No. In Hong Kong, like everyone yeah. says that. Obviously, like we talk, yeah. we hear about Bali all the time. It's like the last place in the world you want to be. Mm. Lovely places, but yeah. the jails are the last place you want to be. Yeah, sure, sure. But I mean, look, you know, I, I um, you got by, did the best we can under extreme circumstances. You're a tough man, man. I couldn't fucking deal no. with that shit. I think I'd struggle a bit. But then time come around and... um. Was you was it appeal against or was did you get tra- did you get transferred? Yeah. No, I, tra- I got transferred. I mean, we could have went through the whole process if we want. You know, we're going to appeal and all that sort of business. But then we thought, with well, the time that appeal mm. could go, it could last for another it twelve drags, months yeah, and drag it? out. And you know, there was a process going in where I was going to get transferred back to Australia. So we just elected, which obviously that means that you've you've got to accept your plea of guilty. Which even though I don't. Yeah, but, you I mean, still got it to get back to, home. To get back. But and at I mean, the end of the day, it would have been better to be home with your family. Yeah, Obviously, correct. they can come and see you all the time. That's right. And yeah. so I just thought, well, we'll just go about it that way. Silver water. Mm. What's silver water mm. like compared to Hong Kong? Not a lot of difference. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, you know a couple of people that have been in jail and they do not wrap silver water up. Yeah, no. It's not really good. I don't think any of them are. <laughs> but lucky, apparently lucky didn't get it end up in Goulburn. That's what I've been told. Mm. So, um, and, then, and I read this in a little story that... When you actually flew back, you had to actually pay yourself to escort people back over with you. Is that true? Uh, like police or something like that? Like an escort? Or d- how did you end up getting from like the transition from getting from Hong Kong? Yeah, to well, you Australia? fly back. They, they fly you back. They I, just had, fly I, had two, I had two blokes come over and pick me up and fly me back. They were, they were good blokes. Did they have to be Australian to fly back yeah. and then go back over there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, was, that was good as gold. Okay. 
Shut the back. We don't really see me. Where, where, do where do you sit on the plane? When <laughs> you're going you don't no, we're at the people. back. We're at the back. Up the back. Yeah, but I was you going to be handcuffed or what did it No, nah, not on nah, the plane. Nah. I wasn't. I nah, did right, but sweet. And uh, sitting there, and I think I watched about four movies on the way back. So I hadn't seen any English <laughs> TV. <laughs> <laughs> what was the food like compared to? Well, I asked, I asked him, could I have a beer on the plane <laughs> on the way out? <laughs> he said, like nah. "Sorry, <laughs> champ, Coca, Coca Cola." Just one, bro. And obviously, when you got over here, it was a lot easier with you. Like, I know it's, it's not great ideal. And like I said, you being in jail for that sort of situation, from a jockey's point of view, is, is crazy for anyone. But obviously, it made it a lot easier because you could see your family. Mm. Like, I've had and family the, in jail too, and it, it makes it easier. You could see your family on yeah, weekends and stuff like that. That's right. And I mean, um, um, the kids were only young. Yep. So, you know, Kathy was obviously under a lot of stress and pressure with the mm. three young kids. And where we were living at Dural at the time, out at, out at, um, out of Sydney. And um, so she had to sort of look after that as well as the kids. And my family would come down and help where they could. And her family, because they were all in, her family was still in Brisbane, and my family were up on the Northern Rivers. So, but they'd oh, okay. always f- come down and help her out. But we were lucky; we had had some very close friends, Jason, Melissa, Brettle, and that. They yeah. they were they were terrific. They used to help out quite a bit, and yeah. and um, had a lot of good friends in Sydney, which all sort of bandied around and helped. You know, we've actually got a good picture, but we'll put it up on the the. Um YouTube, you coming out of jail? He was pretty happy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you get out of civil water. Yeah, well. But what year was that? That was October two thousand and eight. Eight, I think. You walked through from, and then how did you end? Up, like, how much longer did you? So obviously, you obviously applied to get your jockey's license back, mm. which obviously racing New South Wales were happy to mm. do that, and they didn't want to go ahead with all the other stuff that the other crap. That so you P of Landy's is, is, you know, not he's one of the smartest men in racing you'll ever meet. Hands down, Everyone but he's says the same thing. but he's but he's also a decent human being. Yeah, and he was he was the main instigator. He just stuck to his gun, and he said, "Mate, he said you can when you come out." He said, "Everything will be Swat. sorted. You've done your time. You've done whatever you've done wrong. It's yep. all finished with. You get your license back, and away you go." So um, he was he was very good like that, and, and stuck to his word. And um, so I think I can't remember when I started riding, but I, I know that. I'd been pretty focused. I'd been pretty tunnel visioned and well, focused about getting fit yeah, yeah. and being ready to ride. So as soon as I did get back riding, I'd have no, I'd have no sorenesses or not be fit and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I made sure I was very, very fit and healthy. And and um, I think I I started off. It took me about a week before I rode a winner, but I rode a, two winners. <laughs> a at, week. Yeah, a week. <laughs> two, two winners at Hawkesbury sort of got me rolling and yeah. that sort of thing. Did you find it? I I don't really remember it to be honest. But did you find the reception back from? Obviously, trainers and, and owners and that thing was, wasn't too bad when you come Yeah, back. it was pretty good. I mean, I, I got good support, but there was mm. a few that were a bit reluctant. But, I mean, overall, mm. I think they were, they were, you know, most of them, the main ones that I normally rode for were pretty good. And, I mean, none more so than Guy Walter. He was he was a he was a terrific yeah. person. He really supported me, you know, to the end. He was Such a great. Such a wasn't he? Terrific fellow and a very, very good trainer. The best, I remember. Uh, we always talk about the best trainers that, and mm. he's my best trainer, you know, mm. that I've had anything to do with. Yeah. I mean, before Hong Kong, I was riding obviously Defy and that for him. Well, he was just a, yeah. he was a great horse. He yeah. beat Lonro twice and, and, um. So you walked free from jail, you're back to riding. Where, how did you end up back in Queensland? So how I many got, years was it? Um, so we moved back in about, I think it wasn't that long. We moved back in, I think, 2010. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'd sort of come out and we'd sort of got going again and, um, because the only reason I say that is because I was back riding in Brisbane when I picked up the ride on Desperado in the Caulfield Cup. Okay. And I won the Caulfield Cup on him on 2010. And we'd only just literally been back in Brisbane then, so that's when it must have been. And um, um, we'd, mo- we'd moved back to um, – well, actually, what happened was I think Toby had been given the, the job as training for Nathan Tinkler. Toby Edmonds. Yeah, Toby yeah. Edmonds. And um, – he he found me at Magic Millions. I think it must have been in well, whatever year it was, the January before. And he said, "I'm." He moved back to Queensland himself because mm. he was at Warwick Farm. And he said, "Mate, he said I'm moving back to Queensland, train for this bloke." He said, Are you "Interested in coming?" I hadn't even thought about it. Mm. And I sort of got to thinking. Well, I was in. I was at the coast, and I sort of got to think. And I said to Kathy, "What do you reckon?" And because her family was still all up still here, up here yeah. and we just thought, well, you know, it might be a time that we can come back and sort of slow down a little bit and just, you know, ride for, ride for a good trainer, and you know, we have some nice horses, and obviously he was going to get more horses, and um, so that was probably the main 
catalyst as to mm. why we moved back up here. And, you know, it was a good decision at the time. I wrote a lot of winners for Toby. And, um, so you had a good couple of seasons, didn't you? That's what, mm. not long after I'd been up here and you come up here and obviously you had a couple of really good seasons. Mm. I think you win the premiership. When did, what year did you win the premiership? Yeah, I don't know. You rode the most winners. Yeah, I think that, it was like 2013 or something, something like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. But you, um, and obviously, the, and then, the, like I said, the Caulfield Cup was in there too. So the Caulfield Cup was 2010, but I'd only just literally moved up moved here up then. Because I remember yeah. that, because you obviously had your manager, Gary Legg. Yeah. And then obviously you'd been here for a little bit and then you went to Caulfield, obviously, to ride this horse. Yeah. Yeah. How did you come about getting on that horse? Um, well, that was just, that was actually Gay's just stable. Um, um, Mark Webby was Gay's manager at the yeah. time. And this horse, Desperado, he was he'd won the Caulfield Stakes and was in the Cup and had no weight on his back. And Nash couldn't ride the weight, so he said, "You want to ride in the Caulfield Cup, Melbourne Cup?" And I said, "Yeah, good as gold." So, um, I mean, I'll never forget the day before the Caulfield Cup. It was bucking down rain, just oh, did it? bucketing down rain. And there was even talk, like it was a Caulfield Cup. There was talk that the meeting might be abandoned. Call them off, I Call them off. You know, it was that much rain. And I'm I'm at home and I was doing the form and I said to Kathy, "You know, it's only." Four horses in this race that can actually handle the wet. The rest can't handle the heavy. There's only four, and mm. Desperado was one of them. And you wouldn't believe it, they run the first four. Oh, did they really? Yeah, there was, there was wow. my horse and um, um, Monaco Console and whatever else, whatever run third and fourth. But, I mean, they were, they were the only wet trackers in the race. That's crazy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And obviously winning that race was a pretty big thing, for, even though it was obviously after the whole Hong Kong thing situation and obviously coming back and winning that Caulfield Cup was pretty big for you because that was obviously gave you the... Grand Slam. Yeah, that was so. Many other jockeys have done. Yeah, so that was the last leg of the, of the Grand Slam. I'd won two slippers, a Cox Plate, mm. and, a, and a Melbourne Cup, and so to win a Caulfield Cup was good. You know, it was a sort of tidy. Was it always up. like winning all these other races, or leading like over the over the years? Uh, were you aware at the time, like you, you know, the Grand Slam? They say if you ride a Caulfield Cup winner, or was it just you rode the sort of Caulfield Cup winner and you're like, and sort of. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Or is it yeah. something beforehand that you No, I sort of that or well, I never really focused on sort of going out to try and win a grand yeah, slam. Yeah. Like that was but I mean if it happened it happened and I, I yeah. suppose I was lucky enough that it did. But I mean, um it was funny, the year before the year before I rode um Desgrade, I rode a filly called Daffodil, four year old mare in it and um she was right in the market in the race. So we, we went down and had the weekend in Melbourne and I said to Kathy, I think this thing's got a good hope in it, so We've turned for home and, and she's opened her lungs and took off and I thought, I'm home. He's, so, of course, it was just the introduction of the whip rule, wasn't it? So I forgot to count and I'm whopping <laughs> this. <laughs> it. Yeah. And I just, all I could see was see was it winning the race. Anyway, she, she ended up running fourth. She ended up running fourth. So I've... I've limped out of Caulfield Racetrack with a $4,000 fine. <laughs> <laughs> you made nothing. And got beat. <laughs> that was a, that's a good fine for back yeah, then when the first yeah, rule came out. Didn't, yeah. They didn't miss me, but I didn't miss it either. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, what do you think of the whip rule? We always ask everyone that comes on. We asked Christian yeah. the other day and we asked Larry, what, what's your feedback? Obviously, being a jockey, now a trainer, look, even own horses. Look, you know, I, I think it's it's one of them rules. It's it's unfortunate it's here to stay now. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's 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 unnecessary. Um, but it's the way. Unfortunately, it's the way of society these days. But I mean, if they were in the if the real people that were worried about it sort of come and spend a bit of time, yeah. in in you know in the coal face and seeing what the horses are like and what we actually do. I mean, they they realise that they're actually they're pampered. Yeah. They, oh, they, don't they, get, they don't get they don't get it and and, and whips and whips the whips that we use or the whips that jockeys use now yeah. Yeah. they don't hurt them no. all they do is make a noise and um you know all these people about saying that we have to change i mean you don't have to do anything no you don't have to yeah, do that's anything. what just, i that's why i get it just, I get just because so, just because some place doesn't use whips doesn't mean we yeah, don't exactly. have to but I mean, the, the stewards do a good job now. They crack yeah. down on, on the whip rule. They don't want to see jockeys going hell for leather and whopping. But just because people are breaking the rules doesn't mean we need to change them again. That's, That's what right. I don't get. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I agree. I, I've Like I, I've said it previously too, like they've already sort of changed them enough already, I think. I mm. think if they keep going, it's just going to sort of ruin racing to yeah. a point. Well, you know, yeah. you, you're from the old, like the older school. Like you've gone from like the... The whips that actually mm. did it, not hurt oh. the horses, but actually did make a difference. Mate, some of them are whips. Some of those whips we used to use, like, mm. like they they did hurt. Oh, of course they they, they yeah. did hurt. But uh, th those horses, they 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 responded to them. Yes, and you had more control over them. Yes, and yeah. you got more of a result with them. See, isn't know? it funny? We have more green horses now than you ever did like yeah. back then. Correct. Yeah, more yeah. interference. It's more it's, interference. it's it's not just a. It's a an device aid. to make them go forward. It's no, a tool to keep true. horses straight. Exactly. They respect it. That's right. 
Yeah. So you like your jockeys logging their horses? <laughs> oh, not necessarily. It's, well, it's funny, you know. It, it's it's funny. You, you you can pick your horses that that need. Like there are some horses that need it definitely, but I mean, there's some fillies and that that don't need to be hit at all. Yeah. You know, every horse is. I, different. I'm the same with you. I'm like fillies. They they yeah. need a reminder here and yeah. there. But then you got colts now, and obviously mate, with all the the change of the rules with um, cutting mate, horses lazy, and testosterone. Lazy big colts. They're cunning, mate. Yeah, of course they. They're, they're the know, first they, ones they want to put the white flag. They up. know what you're thinking before you even do it. The colts, mm. you know. So just looking. Um, Everything's you're back in Queensland. Everything's been going good, flowing into things, and then um, all of a sudden, you, 2012. Uh, I'm not sure how the story goes. You find a lump in your neck. Mm. Um, throat, is it? Yeah, mm. in it's the right. throat. Sorry. Did um, you did you uh, did you ask Bernie the, the Bernie the sunshine? Was it is he still the yeah. was he the guy there? The, yeah. the, sorry, the doctor, the doctor, Bernie, club yeah. doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? I was. Um, I'd, I'd just gone to the dentist, my local dentist, to um, get a check up, and I'd been, I was riding all too hard in the Cox Plate yep. on the Saturday, so, and I went, it was in the week, and I'd been wasting the riding 48 and a half, and the young girl said to me, she said, oh, she said, you've been a bit off colour. And I said, no, I said, not really. She said, oh, you run down. I said, oh, well, I could be. I said, I'm wasting, I've got to ride 48 and a half. She said, oh. she said well, just keep an eye on it. She said, you've got a bit of swelling in your tonsil. And I said, oh, okay. You know, I thought nothing more of it, you know, because mm-hmm. I'd been wasted and I just said, oh, well, a bit run down and that's it. So <clears throat> went down to Melbourne, rode all too hard, run second in the Cox Plate, come back and about a week later, I'm cleaning my teeth one morning, my tonsils like a golf ball at the back of my throat. Yeah, okay. mm-hmm. I said to Kathy, I said, this don't look right. And she said, oh, well, she said, you better go get a look at it. Obviously, you just thought you needed to get your tonsils taken out. Well, I, I didn't know what it was, mate. Yeah. I didn't even know if I just had a bit of an infection because yeah. I hadn't been sick. I wasn't sick, see. Have you still got your tonsils? Mm. Yeah. I oh, see. So I've got mine. Like I don't. Yeah. So do you have to get them all taken out? Obviously. Well, I, I ended up having With, to. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I went to the doctor, and the doctor gave me some antibiotics, and I took them for about a week or something, and never shifted it, never moved it. So they gave me stronger ones. Still didn't move it. So I was at the Cl- I was at Cloundra one Sunday riding, and Bernie Bernie Salisbury, the club doctor up there. I said, Bernie, have a look at this thing. And I said, I can't get rid of it. I said, I've had antibiotics. And he looked at it straight away. Straight away, he said, mate, you've got cancer. Oh, I said, what? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> he said, mate, he said, that's a, ju- that's a whatever the technical word, sarcoma. Yeah. Or he said, you've, you've got a cancer there. I said, Bernie, stop it. I said, I haven't been sick. He said, mate, you don't yeah, get sick when sick. you get them. Yeah, wow. I said, fuck. Righto. So... I thought he was half having a go at me. I was sort of half thinking, well, Bernie doesn't know what he's talking about. I sort of was going... He's very old school guy. Very old school. Yeah. But this before or the races? Or after? <laughs> Thank Christ it was it was at after. the tail end of the meeting. <laughs> and I, I don't think I had too many more eyes left. Because yeah, I, knocking down jockeys left, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the next morning, uh, on the Monday morning, obviously I, I was riding there, so as most jockeys do, I had a sleep in on Monday morning. And uh, uh, got up and Bernie rung our home number. And got hold of Kathy, and she said, "He said to Kathy, has Chris made a booking to go and see Maury, uh, Maury Stevenson, the specialist?'" And mm. Kathy said, "No, why? What's wrong?" Because I didn't tell her. You didn't say anything. Yeah. To her, I didn't yeah. say nothing to her. And she said, "What's wrong?" And she said, "Oh, well, he said I think he might have a have a cancer. You better get him in." So of course, then Kathy's blew up at me and and booked me in. <laughs> you got to pay. Yeah. And anyway, so I went to went to Maury Stevens there and uh, up at Wickham Terrace, and he was he was great. Yeah. He was really, really good. He said, mate, he said, I think you've got a P whatever number it was, P15 mm-hmm. or something like that, papilloma. Um, and I sort of went a bit dazed when he was telling me because he confirmed what Bernie was saying, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, he said, we're going to do this, this, this and this. He said, and, and um, you'll be out of action for seven weeks. You have to go seven weeks of radiation every single day and three doses of chemotherapy in between. And um, this is after cutting it out as well. After cutting it out, yeah. so it was all a long process because they couldn't actually hit me with the radiation until they'd taken the tonsils out and any teeth, wisdom teeth that I had in there. Because once you've been treated with radiation, it affects all your wisdom. Okay. It, well, the way your teeth heal. Yep. Okay. Um, and it was around the time I was riding sizzling. Yeah. I, I was, I'd ridden him in the lead ups, and I, I rode him. I was. I was. I'd. Won on him during the winter. He'd won all those two-year-old yep. races through the winter and the group won in the winter. And um, so it was not long after that. And I wanted to be... No, that's right. I was going to ride him in the Magic Millions Guineas. 
but because of this, then I had to I had to forego the ride on him in the Magic Million Guineas and Craig Williams rode him. Okay, so how uh, actually how long did you end up having off in the end? So it started in the January. It went from January, February, March. I reckon it ended in about March. And they told me not to ride. I wasn't to ride for probably six or eight months or something like that, but I was back riding. Yeah, because I remember you didn't have that long off. No, because I, I, I remember I come back and I won the guineas on sizzling yep. in the winter, in the June or July, whatever it was. Would you put it down as um, an incentive to drive to yourself to come back? Because you sort of had that quality horse there waiting. Look, I probably Cause was. Because you could have easily just hung the boots up and said. And that did cross my mind yeah. about hanging up, about retiring. Um, and I think back now, and I think back now, and I think I was probably a bit silly doing what I did. I think I should have probably looked after myself a bit better, (laughs) but because he was there, I, um, because he was there, I was sort of, I really wanted to get back Mm. and I really wanted to ride him. But I think back now and I think, I think to myself, you know, I probably should have looked after myself because I know when I come back, I remember the first morning I got on a, on, on a horse and I still was very light and weak like i was still only about 46 47 kilos you wow know? really yeah and and I, I took one for a can it was one of kathy's horses and um i felt terrible on it mm-hmm. but as i got fitter and stronger i was riding but but even when i went back to the races i remember i rode one of ours um its first day back snippets caviar at eagle farm and he run third mm-hmm. but even that first day back i knew i wasn't 100 percent right yeah. but it took a long period of time like i was still and lucky pipo said to me he said, mate, you won't be right for a while. He said, you'll take you 12 or 18 months before you're back to normal. And he was right. Mm. He was right. But, I mean, look, you know, it. it um, I, I got back and was riding and, and um, you know, I don't regret it, but I think in hindsight I probably should have taken you the time. You stubborn bloke too. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I think we all know that. <laughs> he would have yeah. thought, oh, well, I'm going to make sure I'm going to get back here. And obviously you got back and you obviously rode for Kelso. Kelso was a big supporter of you and yeah. obviously he's passed now Kelso and, and, same thing and you know talking about trainers before about good trainers Kelso was a great trainer he was a freak you know he, he's one that I probably left out I should have put him in yeah. because he, he was a he never had a lot of horses mm. but they always looked good yeah and he always fed very very well and they always fit he was a hard trainer but they were always very fit his striker was outstanding yeah. always yeah. yeah yeah and he wouldn't run a horse he would never run a horse unless he thought it was going to run well and he'd yeah. trial it wouldn't matter how many times he'd trial it. Yeah, that's and obviously he passed. He lost cancer too, didn't he? he had a lot of cancer and stuff like that. It wasn't. No, he was, he was sort of. He, I oh, mean, he diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he he had it like he had a heart problem as well. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think an infection ended up getting him in. Yeah. 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 Sad. Very good trainer. Um. So obviously, in, and then in 2015, you decided to hang up the boots. Yep. After all that. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, I thought... What, I, made, what was the big decision? Like, what what made you make your mind up there? I think I'd probably had enough riding, you know. Yeah. As much as I missed... When I did retire, I certainly missed the big days. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I must admit, the transition from riding to not riding is a big one. Yeah. Bigger than what I, I probably expected, expected yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, I was probably lucky that I was still able to be involved even with the horses because I, I went straight into training. And... Um, that's when you really work, when you start training. <laughs> <laughs> Riding is just a hobby, I'm telling you. But when you, you know, and I was still able to keep involved with the horses in that sense. But um, um, it's a big transition when, when you stop riding. It really affects a lot of people. It affected me. It still does to this day in a way. Like, I mean, I love riding, mm. um, but I don't miss the racing, day-to-day racing. I miss the big races. Mm. Yep. I miss Melbourne Cups and Golden yep. Slippers and, you know, if I was riding today, Everest and those sort of things. But, you know, the day-to-day mundane racing, I don't miss The usual that. grind, you mm. don't miss that, but yeah. No. But riding the good horses in big races, that's... Because that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a big transition going from a... a like, not many... I wouldn't. I don't know any trainers that have gone sort of from like a jockey to a like bang trainer. Like, and mm. obviously you had your family behind you and all that sort of thing. Your family still work with you now, or your kids mm. and that sort of thing. So it's a bit of like a family affair now, isn't it, with all the kids? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it is. And look, they're they're great. I mean, Corey's, Corey's. I'm very proud of him. He's done a good job. He's sort of he's one of my main men there at the stables, and um, very hard worker. Mm. Kathy, of course, she's always there in the office, keeping control of everything and, and keeping her eye on everything. And she does a wonderful job. And very proud of Caitlin. You know, mm. she's gone over to England now. She's at Newmarket working so over there. Who's she working for over there? Um, 
Uh, so Mark Prescott. Oh yeah. Yeah. So she's over there riding, working, working out, for, working for him, and she she gets an opportunity to travel the world. Like she's been to France and Germany with horses yeah. now, and traveling all around over in Europe. And it's I'm proud of her. She's done a good job, you know. And the youngest bloke, well, he's um, he's got no interest in horses, so he's probably going to be better off yeah, than all of us. Conroe, we never see Conroe. Always the other one. He, he makes an appearance he at the Christmas. Yeah, he party. Yeah, he's, he's always a, <laughs> he's always one of the three. Yeah. So what's he yeah. into? Like, what's he? He, he no, well, so he so he left school and and he was doing a business management course at uni, but he sort of he I don't think he was too fussed on the university <laughs> side. Or particularly, I remember one night we were having a conversation at dinner or something. I said, mate. I said, you know, the only blokes making any money these days are the tradies. I said, the blokes are actually out there getting their hands dirty. I said, all these blokes at uni and that, all they come out as educated idiots. I said, <laughs> educated. They, so they, they got a bit of paper. They've had five years at university, <laughs> get a bit of paper, and then they can't get a job. Mm. You know, yeah, but these, true. I said, these blokes that are prepared to go and work hard and get get a you know get a bit of work ethic behind them, become a trade. So he's now he's do, actually doing a TAFE course as an electrician. So oh, is he really? Yeah. So he's he's going down that and path. And but Corey did the. Flying, didn't he? Flying, yeah. Flying. So he, he was he was going really good, Corey. He, he had his CPL license and could fly a plane. We still can fly a plane, but then he he um he had a couple of mates that he was quite close to had had, had yeah. crashes, and I think that yeah. sort of dented his confidence a little yeah. bit. And plus, the expense of it as well was all getting a bit too much for him. But <laughs> spoke like, with him about that. It's it's, it's pretty scary. Uh, like I've got my license, but it, obviously the helicopter side, but. To I've been lucky enough not to know anyone that has had mm. these incidents, but to it is a bit of a shake up, and mm. you know mm. it's it's pretty scary at times, even when you're out there on your own, and little things start to happen, mm. Mm. and mm. it actually gives you good confidence when you sort of you you know you overcome it, and you oh, okay now this is good, we're prepared for it all, but mm. I, yeah. after speaking to him and um, you know these were very experienced pilots as well, yeah, um, what happened? It's it, is a bit of a bit of a scary I'd, situation. Yeah. I'm not yeah. kidding. I've been playing with Ronnie, bro. <laughs> 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 Have you seen the bloke trying to work out an iPhone? No, thanks. <laughs> Helicopter? Yeah, no. I'm good hands on. <laughs> Anything that's not electronic. Things like that, but... Drive a car. Isn't a helicopter uh, electronic? Yeah, but it's they're actually very basic. It's, you know, they're, <laughs> to your upside down. Yeah, good luck yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's very so, hands on. It's all yeah. feel. Mm. So obviously the, the transition and like it's so hard. Like uh, me and Ronnie have ridden winners for you, and I know sometimes we we turn up and there's, there's a different regime every now and then, and that's a, you're always trying new things, obviously to try and get the best out of the horses. But how have you found like the different styles? Like you know we could we all say we've ridden for certain train, we've ridden for Roger, we've ridden for Bart, we've all we've all pretty much we've all done the same circle, mm. Gay Waterhouse and that sort of thing. How have you found like transitioning and trying to find that? that thing that makes it work and, and you think that makes it work with the horses? I don't think it ever stops. I think you're always learning. I yeah. mean, the horses are always different. So, you know, sometimes I do, I, you know, I, because I'm probably still finding my feet to an extent, mm. but I mean, I'm, I know the basics and how I want to do the basics, but I mean, every horse is that little bit different mm. and um, certain things work for certain horses and you've just got to find what, what ticks with a certain horse, you know, yeah. like, and... Um, um, you know, like all the trainers I rode for, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the, the main, your horses have to be fit, mm. they have to be healthy, they have to be well fed, and they'll do the rest. You mm. know, there's no, it's not, at the end of the day, it's not really rocket science. If they're fit and healthy in that, they'll run. Yeah. It's obviously hard. Like, you know, being from a jockey to a driver, I don't know how you do it, man. <laughs> like, we, we say stuff. We talk about it all the we time. We talk about it all the time, and okay. we give him okay. shit on the, on the walkie talk, and then we just fucking walk. <laughs> you know what I mean? But. <laughs> We, we can we ride a horse and you think, oh, geez, this thing's not going real well. We can walk away and we don't want to ride yeah, it again. Yeah, We're, that's right. You've got it in the barn. You've got to fix the problem. Well, to me now, like, well, if, if you guys say to me, this is no good, I don't want to ride the thing, it gives me a bit of an incentive to, to, to prove you wrong, you know? I know that, So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll probably, I'll, you know, I'll tinker with a few things yeah. or I'll try and do a few different things with these horses. And, like, to me, that's that's what a good trainer does. Mm, you know, they, yeah. they make a... a they can't make a slow horse go faster, no, but they can make a horse gallop to their maximum, yeah. you know, and to the best of their ability. And if the horse has got no ability, well, it doesn't matter what you do. They're not going to be able to win a race. But I, don't, I didn't write this down, but what was your first winner as a trainer? Uh, it was one of Dynamics, actually, Specific Choice at Ipswich. Oh, yeah, Specific Ma Choice. Yeah, yeah, was that like a buzz, like compared to, like, what, what's that a buzz compared to riding? Yeah, buzz? well, it was on the day, yeah. Um, Matty McGilvery wrote it. Oh, did he? Yeah, Matty wrote it. <laughs> did yeah. you give it a good ride? <laughs> 
Well, it was easy. It was a sit and steer job. All he had to do was go to the front on it. <laughs> Poor Matty. <laughs> I love stirring, Matty. <laughs> um, so, like, yeah, obviously it was a big thrill. You know, it I mean? was. Like, yeah, it was. And obviously, there's so much heart. Like everyone is saying, like, I actually, when I was overseas, like, you get more a bit more involved with the training side of it. Mm. I don't know if it was like in Hong Kong, but where I was, it was. And I actually found a lot more enjoyment out of riding horse work every day. And obviously. Um, going with the trainer and what sort of stuff we're doing the horse and then mm. the actual horse breeding there's a lot more um, I don't know there's a lot more satisfaction out of it and that's, and that's the thing yeah. with the training side of it you know like that's what it is it's the satisfaction of, mm. of getting one ready you know training it up getting it ready educating and then taking the race and seeing it win it's a great thrill and then you know the big races if you can win a big race well it's, it's incredible you know I give him a bit of shit last Saturday I said I walked past him because I knew he would have been laughing the other day he had a horse uh was also one on saturday the main race smart. one of the race smart miss smart, uh, smart, smart meteor second up 2000 meters yeah and like uh, six months ago we we're just like trying to find a good two-year-old yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> sort of two training sprinters and all of a sudden they're second up over 2000 yeah. winning like champions like they're gonna win a derby so yeah uh, but he but that's i think that was just a case of i sort of backed my horse because mm. i mean he'd always He's always shown something. Always shown me yeah. something right from day one. He always show, showed me a bit of ability, mm. and um, used to always get back and then run into trouble. And was always had always had an excuse, you know. Mm. And then um, the last run I gave him, the end of last prep, was a fourteen hundred stakes race. He was still a maiden, but yep. I run him in a stakes race. He only got beaten two and a half lengths. He went really, really good. And um, but he was out of a, a staying family, like the tempting lady in Tempest Morning, like they won the Oaks and that sort of thing. As Phillies in Sydney, so I just backed. Him my judgment and the horse's ability that he'd stay. I didn't know if he'd stay or not. I just assumed he would and, <laughs> and um, trained him as a stayer. Because his he's he's win at Tournament Star for was pretty good. It was a good it win, was, you yeah, know. So. And it was funny because young Justin had been riding him work and he used to come in, boss, this is flying. Boss, this is flying. I said, Justin, I'm sick of you saying that. You say that about every horse. <laughs> no, boss, I'm telling you, this is flying. So I couldn't help myself. I ended up getting on him on the Thursday morning before the race. And I just took him for a bit of a canter and did a bit of work on him. And I come back in now. I said, this is flying. This. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll quickly talk a little bit about Justin too. Like he's yeah. obviously a new apprentice. You've had a couple of apprentices in the past, obviously. And, and you're always willing to help other jockeys and that sort of stuff. But how have you found him? I, 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 well, we've had a pretty good, he's a pretty good kid. He's, he's a good boy. Like, he's oh, so oh, tall. Former, he's a former tall boy. Adelaide in too. No, no. Tall, Adelaide boy. Yeah, That's Adelaide it. boy. We're good blokes, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Hard workers. Yeah, That's it. But he is a hard worker, and he's and he's and I. But I said that right from the start. I said, mate, listen. I said, if you don't going to pull your weight, I said, you're wasting no, your time and my yeah, time. Yeah. I said, I'll help you and I'll support you. But I said, you've got to help yourself, and mm. and he has. He's been good, and and what I like about him is is that he's he's not just a jockey. I think he's a bit of a horseman as well. Yeah, and he I rides he rides him. anything, yeah. and he's um he wants to improve. Yeah, because the first day I put him on a few at Doom, and then he he rode him good, but he rode him bad. Yeah. He was too impatient. Yeah, like he yeah. started getting a bit itchy on him too far out and trying to make long sustained runs on him. And I, and on the Monday, that was on the Wednesday, and then on the Thursday morning, that's right, both Al and I, we pulled him in the office and we went through each ride race by race. I said, mm. mate, just chill, you know, relax. And ever since then, he's done it's that. He's come back and he's saving ground and, and finding bums to follow. And, and he's been riding really good, you know. But he's a tall boy. He's yeah, a tall, very tall man, boy. Tall. And... Unfortunately, look, I think his time in the saddle is limited, but, you know, I hope for his sake it, it isn't, but mm. I think it is. Will he's, be. he's walking around light at the moment. I said, dude, that's, I've been down here. Like, I've yeah. been, we've all been down this road when you first moved to Queensland. You walk mm. around light as a cracker because it's so yeah. hot. You're not used to it. But the thing is, he's, he, the thing is, at the moment, he's staying busy. Yes. And while yeah. he's staying he's busy hard. and while he's riding and working hard, his weight will stay down. Mm. Yeah. But it's when he, when he loses sight of the bunny and, and forgets to concentrate and forgets to work, uh, I mean, his weight will probably go up. Because obviously he wrote a good winner for Chris on Saturday. And, and then yep. I seen him on Sunday. I said, you work this morning? He goes, yeah. I said, I just started last. I said, oh, Chris, yeah, he's got he's you. Got you. <laughs> he's got well, you, he, mate. He has to, you know. Yeah. But that's it. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter. That's, that's old school, mate. Yeah. That's how but, it was. But you know what? But you know what? You, you'll get in the long term. He'll be, be better for it. it yeah. for it. You know? He'll come out of his time and he'll be a hard worker whether he wants to be or not because that's all he knows. That's right. Correct. And it'll, it'll uh, as a kid where he is, it'll do mm. him more good than harm because, I mean, as we know, respect, he's a tall boy. Yeah. And it's yeah. not going to come easy to him, so no. he's going to have to work. Yeah. I always believe a, a good apprentice is a big asset to um, a stable. Uh, if you get the right one, I think you seem to grow with the trainer mm. and you work well together. Um, and I see that you always give an apprentice a go and you always see them improve when they're uh, riding for your camp. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I just think back to my old boss. Like, he... he 
And I just remember the fact that he put me on that horse in the Magic Millions as an apprentice. And the horse was a, you know, he was a 25 to 1 pop or whatever still, it was in the race. But he put, yeah. still put me on it and it won, you know. And I sort of, I always remember that sort of thing. And he always yeah. put me on all his horses. He he used, at the time, Mick Pelling was his stable rider. And I remember when he, when I got my Metropolitan licence and that and my boss started putting me on, well, Mick wasn't real happy about that <laughs> and didn't come around and ride work anymore and all that sort of business. But I mean... You know, I, they, they, even that's, that's the same with us at the moment. Like you, you're putting the kid on a lot, which is great. And our manager says the same thing. Yep. He said, "Oh, and we've got he's got Larry as well, and obviously Larry rides for you as well." And he's like, "Oh, the kid's getting a lot." Right. I said, "But that's that's what the kid needs. Mm. Man. That's what this is how they they yeah. take the next step." And look, how long that lasts, I don't know. It's up to the kid, you know. But while every you give him the best opportunity to do right. something with it. But even like I've had a couple of girls here, and you know who they are, and and, and they've sort of well, a couple of them one. You know, that's not there anymore. Like they, they couldn't ride. Then yeah. all of a sudden they get a bit of confidence and want to be going and apprentice go again. Elsewhere. They go elsewhere. But that's their business. But, you know, the couple of girls that I've got there now, they're, they're good, good girls. They're good. You know, they, they both sort of had lack confidence when they yeah. first started. Yeah, of course. But now they've got confidence and they can go and do gallops and ride. And now well. that they might think things are hard at the moment. Oh, Chrissy gives me a bomb and I'm not doing my times right now. Yeah. But that's, that's, the, that's where we've all been yeah. through yeah, that. Right. Like everyone cop that. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the kid's going good. I don't mind him too. He's got he's got a he's got the right attitude. Yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has. No, he has. And he's he's uh <laughs> so <laughs> he's a good kid. He's a good kid. So what? what I, I said to Corey, I said, oh, because we see obviously Corey in the mornings and that sort of thing. And I said to Corey, I said, we're doing a podcast today. He goes, oh, really? I said, well, tell us something about your dad that we don't know. That and he goes, tell him tell the story about when you nearly killed me when I was six years old. Which time was that? Oh, yeah. How many times did you try and kill him? <laughs> yeah. well, I'll, no, I'll tell you once. This is, this is, said, this, oh, I yeah. reckon this is the time. So we, we're living at Maroubra, down Torrington yeah. Road at Mar- Maroubra. So Keithy yeah. Lawson was next door to me, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Keithy Lawson was a mate of ours. Used to live, I uh, used to work behind the barriers. He was a plasterer. Anyway, yeah. most Sundays there'd be a barbecue and a piss up up the, out the back of our yard. And no races on a Sunday. No race on a Sunday back then. And Jamie Innes used to come around <laughs> oh, and... I don't day. know, whoever knows. Uh, if you your know, kids J- nearly died and then James Innes gets brought up. Yeah. Straight, oh, I know this is not going to end well. So, <laughs> Jamie Innes had this scooter, <laughs> this motorised scooter that he rode from Cronulla, Cronulla to, to Maroubra. No. Promise you. <laughs> Promise you. That's a, that's that's a, a fair. Like Promise car. you. It must go pretty quick. So, it was a motorised scooter and he rode it all the way. So, we're out the back. I said, come on, James, give us a ride on it. <laughs> Yeah, right, away you go, man. See, I had no shoes. No, I, don't, I think I had a pair of shorts on because it was summertime and that. So we're out the back. I said, come on, Corey, jump on with me. So you know how this is going to end, don't you? <laughs> so we drive, we're riding down there, and it's a proper steep hill down down Torrington Road, mm. and I've got the death wobbles. Yeah. And Corey's on it, and we went ass over <laughs> turkey down Torrington Road. <laughs> Corey's got skin off you from arsehole at breakfast time. <laughs> I've tried to get up and shake it off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said oh. to me. He goes, mate, Dad nearly killed me, mate. He said, I still remember it so clearly. Going yeah. down the hill and Dad's starting to shake. <laughs> and then that was all over, bro. Because it was either going to the rocks or going to the side. I, we couldn't, went down. I couldn't stop the bastard. It was going down <laughs> this obviously hill. obviously had no brakes. Had no it. brakes at all. It had no brakes whatsoever. And I could just imagine. You imagine a James, you're just giving you a scooter. Like, yeah. You're a fucking death trap oh, at the best of times. Oh, mate. Yeah, no, he's right. I did too. Yeah, he said that. He said that. And he said, oh, make sure you mention that he wasn't there when I was born either. He said he was off buying himself a new car. No, that's not true. Okay. No, that's not true. I was there. He was I there. I was there, but it was actually a race day and I did get a car, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was there at the actual birth. <laughs> I was there at the birth, so that's not true. What sort of car was it? I think it was a BM. It was a BMW. What was the first ever car you bought when you... Yeah, like a mate of the Mate, I'll tell you what it was. It was a it was a Mitsubishi cult. Gold Mitsubishi <laughs> cult. Cu- yeah, like Mitsubishi cult. Oh, it was, it had it had two two sticks on the floor, four 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 uh, gears, and it had a had an overdrive gear stick as well. <laughs> Pieces of shit. No good. My dad had one too. No good. But was that back no in the good. day? Was that the car? That was like. Oh, fuck, do I know? I just, that was just a car. That was just no, a car. That wasn't a good car. That was a shit uh, car. I think I just bought it because it was cheap at the time. And my old boss, because uh, I remember, I remember because I was. I was still apprenticing that, living at the boss's house. And uh, he said, you know, you've got to pay these off X amount each. I can't remember what it was. But back then I'm thinking, how am I going to afford to pay this? <laughs> 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 and what else did he say? Did he give you up, Corey. You wanted to have it. Oh, so he says, so obviously Corey works in the stables and he's always there all the time. 
and he said, ask Dad about the new Dummy Spitters Award we have on the board. And he oh, said, yeah. for, That's a G up. for December this year, you're way in front. Well, they probably deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> so no, how did well, this come well, about? Big Emma Knox put that up. <laughs> did she? She put that up. And she's only been there a week. <laughs> what <laughs> it? Did, did this Dummy Spitters Award get changed? Because well, previously, weren't you doing like a, a stable hand um, of oh, the week? Barn Buddy like Award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, the Barn Buddy Award's still there. money there or something. Yeah, no, we have a Barn get? Buddy Award. No, they get 100 a month. So the, so the barn buddy of the month gets hundred bucks. Yeah. So what happens with the dummies? Did you got to pay a hundred? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm still waiting till <laughs> the end of the month, and they'll tell me. <laughs> so the, so there's there's an autumn, actually got to There's actually two. There's two awards. There's I hope you got the other award. There's the autumn leaves award. Autumn, I haven't autumn seen that Autumn leaves one. award that and the dummy out. spirit. So the autumn leaves award is whoever falls off the most for the month. Who's winning that one? I think one of the girls are. Obviously, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Justin's far behind that. I think he might have come up a couple of times. Yeah. Oh, that's gold. But no, they're, they're good. I must admit, like it's you've actually got it. Like you know, everyone talks about yeah, stay with that. But when I walk in there, they're actually not a bad bunch of kids. They're a good bunch of kids. And, and obviously, yeah. Al, Alan Russell's there now too, which yeah. a bit of a head there. So, and Ned as well. So, so yeah, and then they're, they're all good, you know. And Al, Al got. Poor old Al. I mean, he's been thrown into the deep end pretty <laughs> yes, quick. And he, he said to me, Mate, he said, "Fucking hell, months." He said, "I don't know if I'll be able to handle this." He, he said. He said it was all right with 30, he said, but now we've got 60, 70 horses. You know, I don't he know if I can hear them. week, I... mate, and I said to him, how are you going, bro? He goes, fucking hell, mate. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, said, you'll be right, mate, you'll be right. Yeah. But he's, 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 he's settled down all right. I think we've sort of got a bit of a good routine now going. Because with Al, like, Al's terrific, bloke, but he tries to do too much. Doesn't you know, he's trying to he's trying to lead by example, but he's, he tries to do everything himself. Mm. And I said, man, just slow down. You've got to learn to delegate a bit more, that sort of thing. And, and I think it's, he's started, finally starting to sink in a bit with him. And, but like, he's very good with the horses. Oh yeah. He's very good with the horses and he's good with the staff. The staff all love him, you know, and he's got the right nature and he's a good bloke. Oh, so so I, you're the hard head in the stables and, and ours are like that. He'd never say a bad word. Yeah, so he, there's a good, I, there's a good cop and bad cop. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing at that Christmas party. He goes, oh, I said, oh, how's the transition gone? Oh, yeah, it's hard, eh? He goes, here, look. And he pulls out his phone. He gets the app out. Yeah, and shows he you loves the showing you the app. So he's got an app. He's got an app there, right? With and heart rate. No. no, no how, how far he walks. So he said, he showed me. He said, have a look at this. He said, I walked 20 kilometres yesterday. I couldn't stop laughing. And so that's every day. He's going through every day. 20 kilometres, 18 kilometres, 15, 20 kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good yeah. guy. Oh, yeah. I, one of the m- m- nicest guys I've met since I moved to Queensland. Yeah. He's a good guy. And obviously, he would have been a good jockey back in the day. Obviously, he was. Yeah, well, he, rode anyway. bra- he, he rode Brave Warrior. Yeah, he, he did. He rode Brave Warrior, yeah. yeah. He, he won a couple of good races on him. And, and um, oh, he rode a heap of good horses. Chief De Beers. Yeah, Chief De Beers, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But, oh, he's a good guy. Anyway, we could be talking to you for hours, but we're going to need to ask you this question and we'll start wrapping it up. Are these ones my questions or you've got your own questions? All right, so we, we always ask people, we always tell people before we go on, um, on Twitter if you want to ask Chris any questions. Obviously, one of the questions was from uh, Mitchell Vicks about Brave Warrior. We've, we've covered that one. Yep. But I've got a couple of funny ones. Like, I always keep the funny ones because they, they never want to write it on Twitter, but they just send you a DM. And <laughs> fucking funny yeah. And this is one bloke, this at, at one bet from Logan. <laughs> oh. He goes, hey, Monty. He goes, you mad. He goes, hey, Muncie, you mad bastard. <laughs> he goes, how do you feel about putting these monkeys on when you could do a better job? Blindfold. <laughs> Hashtag, oh, McGilvery, you've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor old Matty. So poor how old do you, like, and it, it's like, as it is, it's a funny question, but it is a good question. How do you well, go? I, well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, it's funny because, I mean, you guys are mates of mine and, yeah. and not so long ago I was riding and it's, it's for me, I've sort of got to be, I can't be one way or the other, you know. I've got to be try and be fair to everybody. But, mm. you know, when it comes to, I've got to look after owners as well. That's yeah. probably, I, that's my job to look after my owners and my horses and my and clients. And the reason I've got my mother-in-law to buy a horse. But, you know, and I try, and, I try and put the riders on that suit horses. Obviously. You know, and it's, to me, like I watch a race and if I know if someone's had no luck or whatever, I can, mm. I can read a race. I'm not silly like that, you know, but I also know if something's not, not mm. right. But I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's sort of, sometimes it gets a bit tricky. 
<laughs> well, it's hard. It's obviously yeah. You know, you're not, not saying you, you you you're more qualified than any, but you are though. In technically, you are more qualified than putting me or Ronnie on. And I've right. done this. I've done that. You could even come back and say to us, "Oh, I've done this and done that." Like you need to fucking listen to me. I'm like, well, I'm telling you what fucking happened here, bro. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, you know I'm, I mean, I'm not going to do that because I mean, I, I I put yous on. I put my faith in you yeah. as soon as I put yous on. Doesn't matter who I put on, yeah. whether it's you, Ronnie, or. But you do or, use it. You do use only a small group of jockeys still, and I understand. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, I, I've, I've still got a sense of loyalty. Yeah, yeah. You know, I still try to, like, I'll give everybody whoever rides and works for me, I'll try and give them rides mm-hmm. where I can. But I mean, at the moment, I don't have hen, a lot of runners. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I've got this young fella there that's, that's riding for me, and I think he's riding well. Yep. And I'll tell him if he's riding no good, mm-hmm. you know, or I'll take him off if he rides. If he rides one poorly, like, I'll take him off. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. But um, I just try and be as fair as I can to everybody. Yeah. That's why I'm not in there much at the moment. As soon as he starts riding a few bad races, you'll see my face. This <laughs> guy. This guy. I, I, uh, this is not even a funny story, but it is a little bit. I remember when you It first, isn't, but it is a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it isn't, but it isn't. <laughs> but when you first started training, you, remember you used to bring him over to Eagle Farm. I used to ride a fair bit for you, and you had a couple of nice horses. Horse I had to be like, I even read your first Saturday winner for you, I think. What's that, that horse called? Dominant Syndication Horse. It was like it was at a Gold Coast Saturday, and it was actually like technically. Oh, yeah, first Saturday. perplexity. Perplexity, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I was going to Mauritius and I, I said to Ronnie, I said, oh, I'm going. Like he's the same man. He just said, fuck, try and get into Chrissy. And he goes, man, I don't, I don't really know Chrissy. And, you know, he's a bit of a hothead and I don't, I don't deal with I that sort few, of, I I don't deal with sort of trainers real good. <laughs> I had a few run-ins with him when he was an apprentice like, years and years ago. I said, mate, he's had fucking run-ins with everyone. That's how we used to ride. But it was, it was good to see you like. Ronnie, go. Oh, I'll ride work for you. And you know what? You had a lot, actually had a lot of runs. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, I'm, mm. Ronnie rode, rode a lot of winners for you. Yeah, me. of course. And he still will. Yeah, but he still will. But, but it's know. hard. It's it's just I just I I I'm not saying it's hard, but I just see the the transition for you saying you certain jockeys and that not not to say that you do, oh that jockey's no good of a rider, but you still no. put him on if it suits that horse. And yeah, I think that's what you've put the train hat on. You've actually worked it out all yeah. right. Yeah, and you know, like also there's this owners have their oh, input. Course. You know, they might have a friendship with a certain rider and that mm. sort of business. But you know, at the end of the day, you just got to do the best thing by the horse too. Yeah, and just quickly on two on owners, owners you rode for and owners you train for now, people like Max Whippy and mm. Desperados owners and things like that. It, yeah, it's been good to have that sort of. Support it has Max. Somebody. It has Max has been super. You yeah. know, he he he, he was um, it was funny. Um, he he come into Lucky Black was the first horse that mm. he bought, and um, I said to him, Max, I said I think I've got a horse that you should be buying. And he said, mm. What is? And I told him, and he bought it, and. It was it worked out good because every time he won, Max had something on him, and it was always at, at the right odds. Except for one day, Maddie rode him at Caloundra. Maddie, <laughs> we'd had him. I'd got him oh, ready. I remember this. I'd got yes. him ready at Caloundra. He'd had he'd had um, he'd had three burnarounds, and he was he was in an open handicap at Caloundra. It was a good race on a Saturday, and he was he was fifteen, ten, ten or fifteen mm-hmm. to one. And I said mm-hmm. to Max, "This horse can win today." He said, "Oh, okay." So he's backed him, and it's turned for home, and it's hit the front. Matty's whip's gone a hundred mile up in the air, and he's dropped. And he's got he's got beat a head and a neck, run third, something like that. And I rung Max that night. And I said, "Sorry, Max." He said, "Fuck me, dead." He said, "I caught that whip in fucking Sydney. It went that high." <laughs> but anyway, but he, he he was that was the first horse that Max come in with me, and it, it, yeah. uh, he's been a terrific. He's terrific a good sport. guy. Good he? guy. I always said everyone too. Like the first got like I left Sydney, and I left Sydney not abruptly, like when AI was on sort of thing, and. There was only one person that said to me, he shook my hand and said, mate, I said, I'm going to Queens. Like I said to Roger, and Roger was pretty good to me, to be honest. Mm. And he shook my hand. He said, mate, if you ever need anything, you ever need money, you ever in trouble, always mm. ring me. Mm. Mm. And that's the mm. sort of bloke he yeah, was. Yeah, oh, 100%. Me? Max is a super guy. And he, he, you know, he, he'd rather do you a good turn than a bad turn. 100%. And that's why like when, when first Crush won the graph and a couple of, other, you know, a couple of years back, it was good for him because his wife had died not long before yeah. that. So it was good. Yeah. It's really good. Okay. Oh, I better ask you this other question. This is from, <laughs> this is a funny one. This is from at Jockeys Managers, Asso- Managers Association. At Jock Managers Association. Yeah. Yeah, right. Geez, you follow some strange people. No, they follow they us. Follow <laughs> they, they seem to be a, a reoccurrence of some of these. So <laughs> they're having is, a bit of kick out of it. This is funny as fuck. Why do you get so cranky with Jockey Managers? Question mark. We have seen an increase in rider agents needing counselling since you've taken up your <laughs> trainer's licence. <laughs> Hashtag Broombrack Penno. <laughs> 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 so 
So we all, everyone that doesn't know this, like you were, you were kind of like trying to do your riders yourself, and then you got Glenn Prentice, and then you, you was helping you do the riders, and now you're kind of back doing, you're back doing yourself. I don't even know, you're back doing it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I do all the norms and acceptances and that sort of thing, and. Um, my manager always I, I, had, I had Bella doing it for a while yeah. before she wanted to become an apprentice. Yeah. But in the end, no, well, like, as I said to a few of them, I said, you can't bullshit a bullshitter. I said, <laughs> <laughs> my manager just said his best ever saying is, he goes, has Ryan got a ride in the 200 metre maiden? Yeah, what is it? What? Doesn't he want to ride it? He goes, no, nah, mate, I'm just asking what horse it is. <laughs> he said, he's biting me fucking head off before he even asked what horse it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gary, does Gary have any other jockeys at the moment? Gary? He used to be your old Gary manager. League. Gary uh, League. No, he does. Scotty Galloway, Galloway I think. Yeah. Oh, so you used yeah. to give him rides, obviously? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Gary, <laughs> Gary's been on the end of it too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brett, so this is another funny story. So Brownie tells, he goes, oh, Jock caught the biggest fucking pay I've ever copped off a train. I said, <laughs> I said who was it, bro? He goes, fucking Muncie. <laughs> Money Sean's uh, rides on something more. So I said, oh, I went back and watched. It wasn't even that bad. He goes, oh, I fucking copped it. He goes, it was no, good, he, he didn't cop it. He didn't yeah. cop it. Uh, he yeah. didn't, Randy never copped it. No, he said he copped it. <laughs> I said, mate. mate. He said, they haven't even gone past the line. He goes, my phone was ringing already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Right, we've got a bit of fun questions. We've narrowed it down because it's been a long podcast. So we won't it's go going quick, though. Too many. Mm. Bit of time there. Rightio. Uh, oh, these, sorry, these are internet questions. So these right. are just random questions. Righto. So we sort of, we throw it up a bit and ask different people. Um, would you know, I didn't write these questions out just quietly too. Would you know when you're going to die? When you're going to die or how you're going to die? Oh, good God. Um, no. It's pretty deep. I don't think no. I do. No. You don't want to know when you're going to die? Oh, do I want to know when so I want to die? So when are you going to die or how are you going to die? No, I don't want to know. You don't want to know when nah, you nah. sneak up on you one? Yeah, no. I'm yeah, just, a lot of people always say Just get and live every day like it's me last. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. No, good answer. Good That's answer. good. Fair enough. If you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? One person, dead or alive. It's a good question. Only one? Uh, oh, well, seems for Christmas, we'll give you two or three, <laughs> if you want. I reckon... Um, can I get three? You can, you can have really? three. I'll have Nelson Mandela. Okay. Matthew McConaughey. Okay. Yeah. I reckon that'd be good. And only two. And uh, Margot Robbie. Oh. <laughs> That's the three. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Good answers. Yeah. Where's that? Uh, how would you... Matthew McConaughey. Where's... I, I reckon he's I a cool him. dude, he's man. Gone, he's yeah, a cool yeah, dude. Man. I'd love to have a beer with him. He'd be a great yeah. bloke. It's just yeah. the accent. I reckon he was out on, um, I've seen like a bit of a doco on him before and he was out in Australia or something. Yeah, yeah recently, yeah. He's a, he's a really cool dude. I like yeah. him. Right, oh, my favourite question. If you could fight one person to the death <laughs> and swap their life, <laughs> who would it be? If I could fight one person so to gotta, the death. You've got to you gotta kill someone or beat someone, but then you get their life. Where are we? Um, Everything so we've had we've money. had um, Mark Zuckerberg. Larry chose Mark Zuckerberg because he could take him out. Mm -hmm. And Christian had Tiger Woods because he wants to be a grass golfer. Right. You got to be able to beat him too, though. That's the thing. That's the key. Yeah. Frankie to Tory. <laughs> Frankie to Tory. Go. Frankie yeah, to Tory. Really? Good one. Yeah. Yeah, Frankie. Did you idolise Frankie? Oh, he's a good rider. Oh, yeah. He's okay. a very good rider. But he's a good bloke too. Yeah. Okay. He's a lovely, he was a lovely yeah. guy, you know. Yeah, like he, he was a, he yeah. was just a, yeah. um, he was a bloke's bloke, you know. Yeah. But he was, um, for all his ability and success and, and wealth, he's just a normal bloke. Yeah. yeah. I rode, a, uh, when he come over the international and that in Singapore, and uh, he knew a few of the other boys and we were all out. Obviously, he knew Robbie and that, and we are all out drinking, having a good time. He was a good, mm. good fella. Yeah, good guy. Mm, I never met him there, but seems a good job. Mm. Very good jockey. All right, well, thanks for that. Thanks for um, coming on and being open and honest with us. It was pretty thanks, good. Thanks, boys. Pretty fun. We could have yeah, got yeah, off for hours. It could have been a lot. We ended up boring people to tears. <laughs> 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 need need, need to bring another drinks. beer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. But anyway, no. thanks for that. We appreciate, obviously, what you're doing with the, guys. being a jockey and being a trainer and obviously helping the kids out. It's good. Thanks, guys. Yeah.
Thanks right. for the time. Thanks, Cheers, mate. Chris. Thanks. Boys. Thanks.